fast is out the out the door to your left. Ladies, you're welcome to stay in here too. But uh, we'll make sure you know about that. Several years ago, I was at polishing the pulpit and I had to stay off site. And my wife was going to come later, and I was trying to figure out how I was going to get to polishing the pulpit. I was going to have to walk about a mile. wasn't too bad. Saw a guy with a hang tag that said polishing the pulpit, and I went up and I said, uh, are you going to PTP? And he said, yeah. Can I get a ride with you? Well, that was Michael Height that gave me the ride. So I returned the favor yesterday and picked him up at the airport. Scared him by running a red light and uh, looking at my phone, trying to read a text of Mike Vestal when he was coming into the airport. But uh, he's here, and he, he's, he says, it's okay. I drive better than Denny Petrillo, so that's a good thing. <laughs> I'm, we're glad to have him with us. He currently serves as the instructor and vice president of operations for Bear Valley Bible Institute in Denver. Uh, he's been there since 2002. And he teaches general epistles, mark, teaching strategies, and ministry technologies. He's also one of the leading experts in Logos Bible software. I'm going to pick his brain on that this afternoon. And if anybody else has got Logos, hang around me and we'll, we'll get some tips. His background is a marketing communication professional and graphics designer. Helps him with his technology and areas for visual communications, but today he's not going to give us anything visual. He's going to give us a lesson on the book of First Peter. His title is Promotion of Freedom, excuse me, Promotion of His Excellence. Promotion of, of His Excellence. We'll have a song, and then Matthew Hart from the Elizabethtown Church of Christ will lead us in prayer, and then we'll have Brother Hyde. Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the morning bright and fair? Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the heat of the noonday's glare? For the gracious Father, we thank you for this time that we have together here today. Father, we're so thankful for this congregation that meets here in North Lexington. We're thankful for the elders that seem fit to have this lectureship once again this year. We know much profit is gained each year, Father, from these lectureships and these lessons that are given. And Father, we're so thankful for the speakers that we have this year. 
and the time that they took to, to prepare these lessons and the time it took them to travel here. Father, we are thankful that they made it safe and are willing to spread the gospel, share the gospel with us. Father, as we just sung, we know that we are to sow the, the seeds of the kingdom. We know that we are to do our part in sharing the gospel with our neighbors, friends, and family members, and everyone that we come in contact with. And Father, help us never be ashamed to do that, and help us always to be willing to uh, take time of our busy lives in order to try to reach someone uh, with the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we are thankful for our brother in Christ that's getting ready to speak uh, to us, Brother Height. We're thankful for the great work he does out at Bear Valley, out in Colorado. We pray that you will bless him and for many years to come to, in that work. And uh, Father, we pray that you help him uh, have a ready recollection of the things that he studied. And as he presents his wor your word, Father, to us, we pray that we will open our hearts and open our ears and open our Bibles and that we will bring these lessons into our hearts and that we will apply them to our lives. Father, again, we're so thankful for the many blessings you've given us through your son, Jesus. We know all things are possible through him, and we know without your help, Father, we, can, we cannot make it. And help us, Father, never to lean on our own understanding, but always trust in thee and keep your commandments. We ask you now, Father, to forgive us of our sins. In Christ, let me pray. Amen. I think we got it. I want to thank you for the opportunity to, to join you for this lectureship. As Paul told the Colossian church, I've heard about your faith. Your reputation precedes you, and, and I feel honored to be a part of this lectureship and share with you a message from 1 Peter. The work you have done over the years, your history here is uh, known throughout the brotherhood, and I appreciate the steadfastness of this congregation uh, I've had the opportunity this morning to meet some of the elders here, and I, I thank them for uh, the invitation to come and join you and to spend some time in the book of First Peter. I want to take you back for just a minute to your childhood. Do you remember playing sports as a little kid? You know, usually it was you know, little things. Maybe it was kickball. <laughs> Maybe it was a game of Red Rover, that kind of thing, but... You remember how it felt when, when choosing teams? You know, they usually pick the two best guys, which wasn't me, by the way. Uh, they'd pick the two best guys to be captains, and then you would just stand in line with everybody else, and they would choose. Do you remember how it felt when they picked you first? It felt pretty special, didn't it? For them to point to you and say, I want you on my team. That... that made you feel good you know you walk over yeah it's, I got this this is good do you remember how it felt when you didn't get picked until last I was one of those guys in a number of sports you know they're picking everybody else and it seems like nobody wants you and I remember one time one of the cool kids I was one of the last ones and I guess he could sense that it it kind of hurt my feelings and he walked over and he said I want you made me feel good even though I had been waited until last it made me feel special that he told me that he wanted me not just that I was last and there was nobody else left but he said I want you on my team it made me feel special you know we like to feel special don't we we like it when people make us feel special and I want you to think of a time when you felt special somebody did something for you that made you feel special whether it was picked in a sports game as a child or you know, someone gave you a thoughtful gift, something that they took the time to pick out just for you. It's a really little thing that my wife does for me when I travel, but she goes and gets me these little cards and she hides them throughout my suitcase. If any of you travel, maybe your wife does the same thing. And, you know, I'll text her, oh, thanks for the card. And she said, have you found them all? Then it becomes a hunt, doesn't it? And throughout the week that I'm gone, however many days that I'm gone, I'll open up my Bible and a card will fall out. And it's nothing huge, it's, it's nothing uh, elaborate, but simply a note from my wife that says, I love you, I miss you, and I can't wait for you to get back home. It makes me feel special, doesn't it? It makes us feel special because she had to take the time to think through that. She had to do 
the work ahead of time in order to make me feel special in the end. Just a simple, thoughtful gift can always make us feel special. You ever get something that you couldn't get for yourself? Anybody give you something that no matter what your resources were, you just couldn't do it, and somebody did it for you? You know, when I was young in my marriage, I wanted to start my own business, and I, I had all these plans and, you know, trying to get your, make your way in the world, and it's the struggle for young people, especially young couples, to have the money. And my father-in-law came up to me, and he handed me a check. He was not a wealthy man at all. But he handed me a check and he said, I want to invest in your future. Made me feel special. It was what I needed. I couldn't get it for myself. I didn't have the money to start the business that I wanted to start. And he said, I want to invest in you. I want, I want to help you. And all the while, while I was telling him all the reasons why I couldn't take the money from him. Ever been there, guys? That pride slips in and... and even though you want what they're giving you, you try to talk them out of giving it to you. And at one point, he, he taught me one of the greatest lessons of my life. And he said, Michael, sometimes you just got to learn to say thank you. Right? It's hard to let people do things for us sometimes. We don't want to be served. We, we, ha we struggle when people, but doesn't it make us special when somebody gives us something that we can't get for ourselves? And Peter is going to bring that into this text this morning. Because you see, our Father has made us special. He's provided us with a thoughtful gift, a gift we couldn't give to ourselves, And he's chosen us, just as Brother Goodwin mentioned in, in the last session at the beginning of verse 9. He's chosen us. And Peter is going to remind us of just how special we are to God, his special people, a people for his own possession at the end of verse 9, and what our responsibility is because we're his special people. It's interesting to me also that in Peter's second letter, he, he says that it, he felt that it was his responsibility before he left this earthly tent to stir you up by way of reminder. And I, I feel like that's my job here this morning is to remind you of things you already know. Peter was reminding them of things they already knew too. And oftentimes that's the role of ministry, is it not? To remind us of what God has already said, things that we've already read in the text, things that we already know, but to stir us up over those things. And I hope this morning to be able to do that. We're gonna begin in, in chapter two, verse nine, if you have your Bible. We're actually going to work our way backward just to see exactly what God has done in our lives that, Paul, that Peter reminds them of to show just how special we are to God. If you remember at the end of chapter 2 verse 8, at the end of verse 8, as Brother Goodwin so eloquently pointed out, he was contrasting those who believe with those who disbelieve and in, in verse 8 he said, that Jesus is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, for they stumble because they are disobedient to the word. There is a group that stumbles over Christ as the chief cornerstone because they are disobedient to his word. But verse 9 starts with, but you, contrasting those that are disobedient with those that are obedient. You are not those disobedient ones that stumble. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Fascinating thing that Peter's doing here is he's using this terminology that was used in the Old Testament to describe God's people, Israel, and he is now acquiring those terms to the church, to us, to the Christians of the first century, but also to us. He's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 15, where he says, Yet on your fathers did the Lord set his affection to love them. He was committed to loving the people of Israel, and he chose their descendants after them, even you above all people. God chose Israel, and now he chooses us. Even though the world doesn't want us, God wants us. He chose us. 
But most of what he's doing here in verse 9 comes from Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6, which says, Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the people, for all the earth is mine, and you, you shall be with me, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, that royal priesthood, and a holy nation. The idea that God has chosen Israel and to make them his possession, that they would become a kingdom of priests and a set-apart nation is what Peter is reminding us that we are today. It's no longer Israel that is his chosen race and his chosen people. It is the church. It is Christians, those that have obeyed his voice, those that have responded to the call of Jesus Christ, as Brother Cliff mentioned to us in the last hour. He has chosen us, and Peter's going to show us three ways, if you will, how God stepped out to make us special to him, that, that people of his own possession. And the New American Standard translates that phrase, a people for God's own possession. The New King James says, his own special people. They're both translating the same word. We'll, we'll deal with that as we move through. But it is this idea that God has done his work in order to make us special. He's, he's done the work to make you as an individual special to him. And Peter reminds us going all the way back to the beginning of the book what God has done. And so we're going to overview that in order that we might understand how to proclaim the excellencies of him. I, I, was, brother, I was talking to Brother Vessel with it last night. Uh, I read something on Facebook the other day that troubles me greatly, and it was uh, a statement that we don't need theologians in the church, we need proclaimers. I don't disagree with the last part of that. We certainly need proclaimers, but if we proclaim without understanding the theology, there's nothing to proclaim. And I'll challenge you that if we don't understand God, if we don't remind ourselves of what he's done for us, we won't proclaim him. Maybe I should say it this way. We don't proclaim him because we've forgotten sometimes. And Peter sets out to remind us, and so I'm going to try to do the same thing. First, he says that we are special because God made us first a people. <laughs> in, in a culture that is fractured with different segments and different ideologies and different races and different cultures all over the world, God has done the work to make his people, his church, a people. And he starts by saying that we are a people chosen by God. We've dealt with that a little bit already, but in chapter one, verse one, King James has the word in verse two, but he says, to those who reside as aliens scattered because of persecution throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen or elect. You remember standing in that line and waiting till the end for that captain to pick you? That's what the Christians of the first century felt like. The Jews didn't want them. The, the Gentiles didn't want them. The Romans didn't want them. They were scattered from their homeland because of persecution. And God says, but I choose you. Those that respond to me are chosen. God wants us. He makes us a people because he's chosen us. And secondly, he says we are a people special to God because we are born again, verse three. Notice throughout this lectureship how many times we're gonna come back to verse three. Understand that verse three is a critical passage in the letter of 1 Peter. This moment in which God through his great mercy caused us to be born again. We have been reborn <clears throat> into his kingdom. We've been reborn from the life that we were in, and God did that. It was through his mercy. We're gonna understand that the concept of mercy is giving something to someone that they can't give to themselves. I don't wanna to say too much about mercy. I know that's Brother Vestal's topic later on, but it is that idea of being given something that we can't give to ourselves. We couldn't give ourselves that rebirth. God did that for us. And he, and he describes that rebirth, first of all, by saying we were born into a living hope, a confident expectation of salvation, a confident expectation of the future, 
knowing that there's something beyond this temporal life, this physical life, that God caused us to be born into a, a confident expectation that's alive because Jesus, Jesus Christ is alive. He says, born into that living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Our hope lives because Christ lives. He's alive. Do we recognize that? Do we remember that? And he says we are born again into inheritance. You know, when I die and they go to read my will, you can't show up and say, I'm here to collect my part of Michael's inheritance. Why? Because you're not part of my family, right? And you can't make yourself part of my family. Well, it was the same with God. We weren't part of the inheritance, but he caused us to be born into that inheritance to add us to the family so that we did have a part in his will. We did have a part in his inheritance. We've been born again into inheritance. And finally in verse five, he says, we've been born again into salvation. He gave us the salvation of our souls, the forgiveness of our sins that we couldn't give to ourselves. We're special, made by God to be a people who have been born again something that we couldn't do for ourselves. Thirdly, he says we are special because we are a people protected by the power of God through faith. If you notice in verse five, he says you who are protected by the power of God through faith. I, what does that mean? Does it mean that there's some special force field that God puts around us that Roman swords are gonna bounce off of? That, that the world's arrows are gonna bounce off, uh, off of? No, no. I don't think he's talking about physical protection much at all, truthfully. If you read through the, the entire letter, there's Christians here that are suffering. But 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 reminds us that no temptation has overtaken you but such is common to man. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide a way of escape also so that you may endure it. The fact that God is actively working in our lives by limiting the temptations that can come into our lives is a powerful idea. It's a powerful reality. God works to protect us. I hope that in judgment we'll not only give an account for our deeds, but that God will reveal to us all those times in our life when temptation was going to come into our life that was going to be too much for us to handle and God said no. I'm not going to allow that into his life because he wouldn't be able to endure it. I'm going to prevent that. That's what 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says. He's, he's working to limit the power of temptation in, in our life and he provides that way of escape so that we can endure it. He's protecting us. The book of Ephesians reminds us that he's given us an entire suit of armor right, to protect us. He's given us these things that can protect us from all the flaming arrows of the evil one, not just some of them, but all of them. What's our responsibility in that? Certainly to put that suit of armor on, isn't it? But he's done the work to provide the defense that we need to defend ourselves against the evil one. That's something that he did for us. We couldn't do it for ourselves. And so we are a people being protected by God through faith, for that salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Next, we're special because God made us a people destined for praise and glory and honor by the creator of the universe. Notice verse six and seven. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The question is, whose praise and glory and honor is he, ta is he talking about? Sometimes we read that too quickly and we think he's talking about Jesus' praise and glory and honor, but he's talking about yours. Those who prove their faith are the ones that are gonna receive praise and glory and honor from the creator of, of the universe. The God of heaven is going to give you praise and glory and honor when Jesus is revealed if you remain faithful. That's something he's gonna do. Does that make you feel special? <laughs> it certainly should. 
the, the being that spoke the entire universe into existence with that kind of power wants to give you praise and glory and honor when he sends his, ba- his son back to collect his church. And as members of his church, we're destined for praise and glory and honor. Well, he also says that we're special because God made us a people who will receive grace. Notice verse 13. He says, prepare your minds for action. Be ready in this world because of the things that he's talked about. Prepare your minds for action. Keep sober. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know, we've talked a little bit about mercy, that idea that that we're given something that we can't give to ourselves. Grace is a similar concept, but it is unmerited favor, right? Getting something that we don't deserve. What Jesus is bringing with him is something that we don't deserve as sinful people, and yet God stepped across time and across the creation to provide us with grace. Is your hope fixed on that moment, that future event in which Jesus brings the revelation of grace into your life, the tangible revelation of grace? should make us feel special that even though we don't deserve it, God wants to give it to us anyway. He wants to help us. And so we are a people who will receive grace. Next he says that we are special because God made us a people called out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We're finally back in the verse I was assigned. (laughs) Chapter 2, verse 9. But the idea that we are a people called out of darkness... Do we remember that? Do we remember our lives before Christ? Sometimes I I think that's hard for us. We forget, and and Peter in his second letter actually reminds those that, that, that are unfaithful have forgotten that forgiveness of their former sins. But do you remember that feeling why you came to the church building that night or, or where, wherever it happened to be? Maybe it was a river, maybe it was a pond at, at camp. But there was a, a, a genuine fear in your life because you recognized that you were separated from God, you were lost in darkness, you were subject to eternity in hell and you wanted to prevent that. That was not a good place, was it? I, I mean, that feeling inside us that we, we uh, were terrified of the outcome, and yet somebody showed us the way out. Somebody taught us through the scriptures that God has provided a mechanism, called us out of that dark place and into his marvelous light. Do you remember what it felt like when you came up out of the water? Do you, do you remember that? Now, for some of us, I mean, my, my hair's turning a little gray. It's, it's turning gray. It's not turning loose, but it's turning gray. It's hard for me to remember back to that time, but I hope that you do. I hope you remember that joy, that elation of being placed in his marvelous light. Colossians chapter one, verse 13. I love how Paul gave the same concept to the Colossian church when he said that he rescued us from the domain of darkness. That place where darkness lives is where we were living and he rescued us. I was a a lifeguard when I was a, a young man and I've seen people drowning. And I've seen the, the hope when you throw them that life preserver and they latch onto something that allows them to come up and take that breath, right? And the sense of elation that comes over them when you pull them to the side and pull them out of the water and, and they realize that they've been rescued. Do we remember that feeling of being rescued? He says in, to the Colossian church he, that he took us out of, he rescued us out of that domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. That's the marvelous light that Peter's talking about. We were lost in this darkness and God took us out of that and placed us in light. We couldn't do that for ourselves. But God stepped in so that we could be a special people, a people for his own possession. And in chapter 2, verse 10, he says that we are special to God because he made us a people who have received mercy. We were once a people who did not have mercy. We were lost in those things that we couldn't give to ourselves. 
but he stepped in and provided mercy. And I look forward to Brother Vestal talking about mercy more in the next session. But secondly, we're special to God because he made us his own possession. That's what this word that we're really talking about means. As I mentioned, in the New King James, it's translated his own special people. In the New American Standard, it's a people for God's own possession. The word here means to be acquired or purchased. And that's what God did, isn't it? He bought us. He purchased us. He acquired us. It's only used five times in the New Testament but it's used in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14, when he says the Holy Spirit is a seal of promise with a view to the redemption of the purchased possession. He wanted to redeem those that he bought. And that's the concept, that's what the word means that we see translated here at the end of chapter 2, verse 9. We are God's purchased possession. Well, Peter's talked about that in the first part of the book as well. He's talked about the fact that we were redeemed. Jump back to me in chapter 1 and look at verse 17 and 18. If you address as father the one who impartially judges each one according to his work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed, bought back with perishable things like silver and gold from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers. He bought us back out of a futile way of life, a a way of life that had no value. It was destined to remain in darkness. It was destined for hell. And he bought us back. You know, when I was a little kid, I used to go around the neighborhood and collect bottles. Anybody do that when they were younger? Used to have a little red wagon and I used to go to all the neighbors and I'd collect all the Coke bottles and all the soda bottles I could. And guess what? I would take them to the grocer and redeem them. He would buy them back from me. When I was a little kid, I could get a nickel a bottle. Then I could go to a movie or buy an order of french fries or something at the drugstore. But he bought them back. That's exactly what God did for us. He bought us back from a futile way of life, a way of life that had no hope, a way of life that had no future except for torment and punishment. And he stepped across and paid the price for us. He bought us into his possession. And he bought us, verse 19, with the precious blood of his son. Notice, you were not purchased. You were not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold from your futile way of life, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Do we, do we recognize the price that was paid for us? how valuable we are to God. He didn't just give money. He just didn't give something material. He gave us his son. That's the price. That's how special you are to him is he was willing to give his own son to buy you back and to buy me back. If that doesn't make us feel special, what possibly could? He gave the greatest sacrifice he could possibly give. The, the precious and we, and. Cliff again talked about this word precious, this highly valued blood of his son. There's no possession God has that was greater than the blood of his son to offer. And yet he did that for each one of us individually. We're special because God bought us into his possession. He made us that purchased possession. He says finally that we are special because of the mission that he's assigned to us you know in chapter 2 verse 9 he not only says that we're chosen race but he says that we're a royal priesthood again acquiring concepts from the old testament and, and applying them to the church the priesthood was that which stood between the people and god to offer sacrifices the mediator between the people and god at the time But when Jesus died on the cross and the veil of the temple was torn, the priesthood, there was no longer the need for this priesthood to make intercession for the people. We have direct access to God, but the role of the priest is now living in each one of us. It is our job, according to Peter's account here, that we are to offer sacrifices acceptable to him. Notice in in chapter 2, verse 5. Brother Cliff reminded us that we are these living stones being built into a spiritual house for a holy, set-apart priesthood. 
We are the priests today. Individually, each one of us as Christians offer sacrifices to God, and the first sacrifice we offer him is the life that he bought from us. Do we not? We offer ourselves. We offer our service. We offer our very existence to him who bought us. And then we have the responsibility to continue to offer sacrifices. Notice he says, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Our relationship with the Christ, our relationship in his church is predicated on the concept that we continue to offer sacrifices that are acceptable to God. That means we don't get to decide what's acceptable, do we? Who determines what's sept- acceptable to God? Only God, and yet we have an entire culture, we have an entire world that thinks that we have the authority to accept, to determine what's acceptable to God. We can worship any way we want. We can live any way we want, and God will accept me the way I am. Brothers, that's, that's a lie that, that the culture has perpetuated for far too long. You cannot come to God and remain the same and have him accept you as you are. God expects change. He bought you. (laughs) He paid for you, and he wants you to conform to his concept of holiness. He wants you to follow him. Chapter one, verse 15, you shall be holy because he is holy, so therefore be holy yourselves in all of your behavior, in all your manner of living. But we are special in that we get to be priests. Not everybody gets to offer those sacrifices to God. Just his people, those that he's chosen, those that he's made royal priests, have access to God through prayer. How special is it that God allows us to talk to him? And I worry that far too often we don't take advantage of that avenue. The God of creation has made you special enough that you can talk to him anytime you want, and you know what? He hears you. When was the last time you did it? You know, I talk to Christians all the time who tell me, my prayer life really suffers. And I understand. I think we all go through that from time to time. But if we are reminded of what Peter tells us here, that that we're special because of that avenue of prayer that we have, that offering that we can make to God, that connection that we have to God directly, would we take advantage of that avenue more often? You see, because not everybody has that avenue, do they? Not everyone can speak to God and have him here. He's gonna say later on in the book, and we'll deal with it in this afternoon's lesson, chapter three, verse 12, for the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. We ha- we're special because we are priests in his kingdom that can offer these sacrifices. But finally, and really, with the few minutes I have left, the assignment that I was assigned. <laughs> we're special to God because of our mission in being proclaimers of his excellence. And isn't he excellent? Think of all the things that, that we just looked at, that Peter has reminded us of what he's done. You know, the word here for excellence means an uncommon character worthy of praise, and certainly it is uncommon for anyone, certainly within our earthly relationships, to go so far or to go anywhere near as close to as far as God has gone to come to us, to span that gap, to reach out to us, to call us out of darkness and into his marvelous light, Look at everything he did to make it possible for you to be added into his family, born again into that inheritance, into that hope, and into that salvation. Is it fair to say God took the first step? (laughs) Maybe it's fair to say God took the first hundred steps towards you. And what does he want? He wants you to take the step toward him and accept the gifts that he's given us, to realize that you've been given the most precious gift you could ever be given, to realize that he wants you, and that should make you feel like his own special people. It should make us feel unique. I want to take you back to the beginning for just a second. You remember that idea that I asked you to to consider a time when you were made to feel really special. Maybe you got that gift, maybe you were chosen... 
Did you tell somebody about it? (laughs) Most likely you did. You ever go to somebody and say, I gotta tell you about this. I I need to tell you what this person did for me. I I gotta tell you how great it made me feel that my father-in-law wanted to invest money in me. I gotta tell you how much my wife makes me feel special just with these dumb little cards that she puts in my suitcase, but it makes me feel so good. I gotta tell you about it. And if we really understand that God has made us feel special, shouldn't we wanna tell people about it? Not just because of selfishness, not just because that he's made us feel special, but maybe so that they can be made special as well. Because I'm telling you right now, the world is craving to feel special. Isn't that what the culture is screaming for? I want to be heard. I want to know that somebody loves me. I want a relationship. I want to know that God exists and that he cares. And who knows that the truth of that more than his chosen race, his royal priesthood, his holy nation, the people of his own possession. Because we've experienced it ourselves, have we not? If we don't feel special in all of this, we're not gonna tell anybody about what God has done. But if we're reminded of just how special we are to God, then we have an opportunity to reach out to a culture that's lost in darkness. Who's gonna call them into light? God is sending the message, but Who's tasked with delivering it? His special people are tasked with being those that proclaim you don't have to stay in that darkness. You don't have to live that life of isolation, feeling alone. There is someone that loves you. There is someone that cares for you. There is someone that can lift you up and transfer you out of that depressing, dark domain of sin and death and transfer you into the marvelous light of the kingdom of his son. Can I tell you about his son? Can I tell you about the gift I couldn't give to myself that God has given me? Can I tell you what he's done? Because man, it makes me feel special. Because I am special, and you're special as his creation too. And let's sit down and talk about this God of heaven that reaches beyond time, that reaches out of heaven and sent his son down on the earth to prove to us that we're his special creation. He did all of that for us. Why do we not tell people? I agree with Cliff that there's a heart problem on the other end. That's part of the reason that we don't see more and more people being baptized, but there is the other part of that that we don't like to talk about that so much, and that is that we're not telling people. Why are we not telling them? Maybe because we forgot. We just get busy with our lives. We get caught up in the, in the rat race, they used to call it. Anybody have tons of free time just hanging around doing nothing? No. Our lives are filled, but they're filled with sometimes the wrong things. They're filled up with all of these things that suck hours out of our day to the point where I talk to people and they say, I don't, I don't have time for a prayer life. You don't have time to talk to the God of heaven that saved you? You don't have time for the God of heaven that made it possible for you to talk to him? You see, we get so distracted by the world that we forget that part of our job is to talk to, uh, to people about him, to be proclaimers of his excellence. Who more than those that have tasted the kindness of the Lord? Chapter two, verse three, he says, and babes long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow into salvation since you have tasted the kindness of the Lord and as the people of God who have tasted the kindness of the Lord don't we want to share that with others so that they can taste the kindness of the Lord it's probably an old saying I'm sure you've heard it before I'm not going to be the first one that's ever said it but if not us who and if not now When? If God's own people aren't willing to promote his excellence, to tell the world about what he's done to reach out to save them, if the saved aren't willing to talk about that, who's going to? 
And, and you know, that vacuum that's created, that lack of discussion about Jesus in the world gets filled with something, doesn't it? And it gets filled with error. It get, gets filled with false teaching. It, it gets filled with self-rule. It gets filled with our own impressions of God. We remake God as a culture into our own image instead of recognizing that he made us in his image and we build God into the God that we want him to be because we haven't been told the true God of the scriptures, the true God of heaven and what he's done and what he demands of us as individuals. I hope that you've been reminded this morning of just how special and unique you are to God. That's what makes him excellent, is what he's done for each one of us as individuals. But I hope that it's not just that you now feel special. I hope that as you walk out the doors of this place, as we enter the mission field, that are beyond the front doors of this church building, that we will come to be the proclaimers of the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Hike. We will dismiss again until 11 o'clock, at which time Mike Vestal will be our next speaker. So, till 11 o'clock.